Letters from a Little Princess Monster By Jorg Poster's Note If you see ads on this video it is from the website. I have not monetized this channel. And remember if you like this video go to the links and give the writer a upvote and the view count. End Poster's Note Chapter 93 Tripartite, Part 11 Tempest Shadow had never been near a dying Wendigo before, and in the terrifying moment as she dove for cover against the resulting explosion, she was positive she never wanted to be around one ever again. When the former wingmaster of the Griffin Airy shattered, his death manifested in an intense blast of pure cold that instantly froze everything in the vicinity. There was nothing left to be seen of the dead creature or the two bat ponies except for a huge ragged chunk of ice which made Tempest glad that she had at least survived with no more damage than the sweat on her coat frozen to her armor. The dry cold filling the council circle made bits of hair freeze to her borrowed armor with every motion, but at least she was painfully alive instead of frozen dead, and she had more to worry about. During her tumble across the frozen sand and away from the frigid blast, she instinctively looked for twilight sparkle. The small alicorn had likewise cringed away from the cold blast across the hostages slash entrees, leaving all of the terrified ponies covered in thick frost. As Tempest stumbled away from the infinite cold and toward twilight, she could see the surrounding griffins shaking their heads and moving backwards, although thankfully the glitter of blue eyes among them seemed to have faded. Twilight, she managed once she reached the trembling mound of tied-up ponies. So cold. Can you do something? Can't, said the small alicorn, who was sitting back up with an attentive expression from under her fresh coating of frost. What happened, called out the largest of the griffins remaining, a frost-covered giant with a raised crest. We were eating, and... Oh, no. Ancestors for a bit. He staggered to one side and spewed vomit all over the frozen ground, followed by several other griffins in the crowd. Since it did not seem as if the griffins were about to attack her for killing the corrupted wingmaster, and the sight of his death was nothing but a huge pile of ice ten times as big as she expected, Tempest Shadow busied herself with untying the captive ponies. It was too late for the suicidal bat ponies, but at least they could get the prisoners and the freed griffins, both tied captives and stunned former captors, evacuated before the whole place turned into an iceberg. While she fumbled with the ropes, it was getting colder, or Tempest was just cooling off after her frantic battle for survival. One of the griffins in the hostage pile seemed to be the son of the Emperor, who was still throwing up, so she turned to him and snapped, purge the rest of the griffins. They've eaten pony flesh and blood, so they're a risk. I know, snapped the big griffin over his shoulder as he dipped his claws into the pile of bound ponies and snapped one of the ropes tying a quaking earth pony servant. It's getting colder since you killed the wingmaster. We have to get every creature out of here before the whole mountain turns into ice. Father. Tend to your own task, snapped the huge griffin, who had just picked up one of his subjects, held him upside down, and squeezed until a vile stream of vomit surged out of the hapless griffin's beak. Or call forth the equestrians from their chariots above to assist. No, said Twilight Sparkle quiet yet loud enough for both big griffins to look at her. Not time. I don't know how much time we have. Tempest Shadow slashed the ropes off another servant with one sweep of her hoof blade, then spared another glance at the giant pile of ice in the middle of the council circle. I swear that's getting bigger. It is, said the huge griffin. Windigos are nearly impossible to kill. Flaws, said Twilight Sparkle suddenly. Everything has won. Wait. Watch. Wait for what? Snapped the immense form of the Griffin Emperor, who seemed on the edge of lashing out at the tiny alicorn in frustration. She said wait. Tempest Shadow flung herself between the two of them, uncertain just why. The answer was not long in coming. Windigo. A voice as loud as thunder echoed across the council circle knocking icicles off the nearby griffin fortress and shaking the ground with its fury. Following the blasting voice was a hammering wall of wind that blew away all the loose snow in the vicinity in one immense wave, 
making all of the griffins and ponies flatten so they were not blown away. An absolutely huge dragon who practically dwarfed the entire clearing slowed to a hover over the council circle, then landed on the unoccupied perches near the back with a crunch of ancient wood as they crumbled beneath his bulk. Come forth, Windigo, and burn. Fire lanced out, a massive gout of flames that licked over the giant block of ice in the middle of the council circle before Tempest could call out. The ice sizzled and boiled, vanishing in a cloud of steam that washed over the area in an obscuring wet blanket. Stop, called out Tempest as loud as possible into the gusts of wind as the dragon inhaled for another breath. The Windigo is dead. Swirls of frozen mist drifted away from the beating of draconic and griffin wings until the massive dragon was revealed again. There was no sign of the ice block where the Windigo had been killed, or perhaps not killed from what the griffin emperor had just said, but there was a shallow puddle of water, and more importantly, it was occupied. Two ponies wreathed in fire stood side by side, then proceeded to walk forward toward Tempest. Water boiled up around their hooves in little gouts of steam as they moved ever closer, and although Tempest was feeling a little overloaded with deadly threats at the moment, she calmed down when she recognized them, and more when they stopped in front of her and the flames surrounding them flickered out. Pumpernickel grunted recognition, his thick grey coat bleached into a near-pure white, while Laminia was only partially pale in a blotchy pattern, although her hindquarters were likewise white as new-fallen snow. Pumpernickel. Laminia. Tempest swallowed back some profanity. Nirik. I think so, said Laminia uncertainly with a shake of her head that showed small flickers of flame still in her mane. Love and rage at the same time. I didn't think it would work. Never do that again. Please. Which left the huge dragon, who was watching with intense focus, as was the pin feathered young griffin perched on his neck. Did we get him? called out the little griffin. Did we melt the Windigo? Child, bellowed the griffin emperor, who had stumbled back when the dragon appeared, and now was staggering up onto his leonine paws. Windigo cannot be killed by dragon fire alone. Although it looks as if you have set it back for now, he added, looking at the puddle of water occupying the Windigo's last position. Now we call for the guards and the airships, said Twilight. Evacuate. You heard the young lady, bellowed Tempest shadow up at the hovering audience as loud as she could. The Windigo are driven back for now. Grubber, get me two airships down here to pick up the residents. Captain Ironbound, assist. Dragon, Tempest hesitated with one hoof extended to point. Do what you can to help. Gather the eggs, called out the Griffin Emperor. Leave none behind. We do not have much time. How do you know, snapped Tempest. Because we know our history, said the huge griffin as Pegasi began to land around them. Commander Hurricane's rescue is known to every chick. Our actions created those, creatures, and we were saved from our folly by the ponies which we spurned. Again. That massive head lowered, and to Tempest Shadow's immense shock, the Emperor knelt in front of her placing his head on the sandy ground in a position of complete subjugation. Tempest Shadow, famed warrior of pony kind. We griffins have doomed the world by our vanity. You may have saved us for now, but the monster will return, more powerful from its destruction. I surrender my people to you in the hopes you will take them to safety while I remain behind to fight. Perhaps my sacrifice can allow you ponies to find a way to stop them yet again. Get up snapped Tempest as other griffins began to kneel behind their emperor. Get up, all of you. Nobody's dying here today. She reached down and lifted the immense bulk of the old griffin, not stopping until he was standing in front of her with white astonished eyes. But, started the emperor, but Tempest was having none of it, and spat her response at the top of her lungs. I did not come here to conquer, old bird. Twilight Sparkle brought me here to save you and your people. She can destroy the Windigo, but we have to get all of you out of here first. Don't say anything, just go. Twilight Sparkle? She's here. The whispers began to rise over the sounds of the last griffins vomiting and the loading of the shivering ponies into the airships. 
It made Tempest hesitate while reconsidering just exactly how the young Alicorn was going to destroy the Windigos as she had promised, particularly when Twilight trotted over to the immense dragon and began speaking to it like they were long-lost friends. It was remarkable how the small Alicorn slipped underneath the eyes of the stunned Griffins, but then again, Tempest Shadow had barely believed reality when there were so many newspaper stories and rumors about the older Alicorn who had rescued Princess Luna. There was little time for Tempest to think while hustling around, directing the griffins and ponies into zeppelins and equestrian chariots. She almost did not notice in the chaotic bustle of loading when the griffin emperor moved closer to her as if he were supervising the efficiency of his subjects in the evacuation, but she did notice when he put his huge beak next to her ear and whispered. You should have let me stay and fight. I will be dead in a few weeks anyway, from a disease which has no cure. No, the rest of my people do not know, he added quickly. I was hoping to find some griff to fill my position before I passed. Now I will die in disgrace, an old fool who fell for the sweetened lies of our ancient enemy. Your son seems to be doing your job well, said Tempest quietly in response, looking at the big griffin who was hefting the overly pregnant form of an earth pony on board one of the airships. The others follow him now without question most likely because he was in the food pile instead of with you and the rest of the blue-eyed bunch. More stubborn than his father. Yes, but, the huge form of the emperor shifted uncomfortably. He has never viewed ponies as equals, just servants and subordinates. Tempest eyed the emperor's son as he carefully lifted a wrapped griffin egg on board one of the zeppelins, which had touched down gently on the frozen sand so the birds on the crew could assist with the evacuation. He has a good start here, and I think I can help. In a few succinct sentences, Tempest detailed her plan into the Emperor's ear, until she was finished and he turned an upraised eyebrow in her direction. You dream big, he said quietly. Good. Asterisk. In far less time than she expected, and still a little distracted at how fast everything was going, Tempest Shadow found herself on an airship rising into the sky. Below. The council circle was beginning to freeze over again, and the last few possessions of the evacuating griffins laid scattered across the icy sand, abandoned by urgency and the increasing cold. Tempest had made sure to spread the griffins out across all the airships and equestrian Pegasus chariots, while the earth pony servants and griffin eggs had been loaded on board the airship with all the stubborn parrots as crew. The non-combatants needed to be placed out of harm's way. Tempest had plans for the rest of them, even the vast dragon which was circling the whole armada with long, slow sweeps of his gargantuan wings. To Tempest's surprise, Twilight Sparkle was standing at her side as the combined force of air vessels climbed. She really had expected the young Alicorn to be standing inside the volcano she was about to create, but since Tempest was not holding on to the power of two, no, three Alicorns in her mortal body, it was Twilight's call. It made her wonder just who was really in charge of the situation, or if in charge was even applicable. Tempest was in charge of the Storm King's forces, of course, while Ironbound was in charge of the equestrians, subordinated to her for the time being. The Emperor, who Tempest had not expected here at all, had actually bowed to her, a mark of subservience that had not been done to a pony for a thousand years, and she had instinctively turned him down much like Commander Hurricane. And the dragon, who had made his nest in the Griffin's burial cave far above their fortress, was quite old enough to know about the Wendigo from their last visit and still followed Tempest's directions to help load the refugees into the airships. And yet, Tempest may have been in charge, but Twilight Sparkle was in control. Tempest was quite glad it worked out that way. I need their attention, said Twilight finally as the Zeppelin rose to an altitude where the mountain's gusts were less troublesome. Cornet. The equestrian bugler raised his instrument and blasted out a series of sharp notes that echoed out across the mountain. A simple instrument would not have been able to sound that far, but the unicorn bugler was using a sound projection spell, and in a few minutes they were surrounded. Airships full of griffins, ponies, and yeti all were looking at Tempest, although she was starting to get concerned about her own mismatched troops. After the fight they had watched, they needed to fight something or they would start fighting each other, 
and that was never good. I see Ken TT talk to them, managed Twilight Sparkle through a low tremor that ran up her pale purple coat as she peered over the airship railing at the glare of reforming ice far below. Need to know how important friendship is. Only thing that can stop the Windigo from returning. I will speak, said the immense form of the Griffin Emperor, who moved up beside Tempest like a feathered shadow. I'll need your spell so I can be heard, he added to Cornet. And I'll need you to talk afterward, he said to Tempest. Make it good. And the Emperor began. It only took a few words before Tempest recognized why the enormous griffin had risen to his post. He spoke of the griffin's ancient ties with pony kind, their Ares scattered all across the world, and their self-imposed separation from other races. He talked of ties between families and companions in battle, of the bonds that formed when facing adversity. Tempest was not used to rhetoric because the Storm King tended to cackling and gleeful bragging, but she could feel a tear begin to form as the huge griffin built to a thundering crescendo. All griffins know we have never ruled over others. We are and have always been guests, invited by Commander Hurricane herself to join the ponies in this new land. This was not an offer she had to make, for it was our arrogance and pride which called disaster down upon all of us. Ponies chose to forgive us that sin and give us a second chance. Generations of griffins have strove to be worthy of that gift, and in one foolish moment of weakness, we have brought that ancient evil back to threaten every living creature across the land. We have forgotten the lessons our ancestors taught us, and I will be unable to lift my head with pride when I stand once more before them. But I will fight the darkness one last time with my new friends. Together we must join as one in order to bring the fire of friendship once again. Together, we must. Asterisk. Monster could feel the moment get closer with every chilly breath of mountain air, and she was no longer afraid in the slightest. Fizzy and Grubber and Emperor and Yeti and guards all around her were connected by glowing lines of fire in her mind. It was the same feeling she had with her own friends times a thousand, swirling around the snow-dusted breezes generated by the airships and Pegasus chariots until she could no longer keep it all inside. She sang. Joy filled her heart with the friendship all around her, and within just a few notes, they all began to join in the song. From the powerful baritone of the Emperor to Fizzy's pure high voice, the hopeless off-key of Grubber and the roaring chorus of Yeti, they all merged together in a giant, thing that she did not have words for. The magic she had been carrying from Celestia and Luna poured away into the growing and glowing fire that filled the mountain below them roaring like a furnace as a column of pure light ascended up into the sky. Still, she sang in harmony, consumed by the overwhelming sensations of her surrounding new friends. The military togetherness of the equestrian guards. The fierce feeling of family among the griffins. The joyful battling of the yeti. The deep faithful sensation of the ancient dragon, rising one last time in memory of his long-dead friends from centuries ago. Monster never even noticed when she slumped to the deck of the airship, exhausted but still wearing a jubilant smile as she slipped into slumber. Twilight? Are you awake? Monster had been tired before. After one of her explosive outbursts, she commonly had just enough strength to drag her tattered and patchy body back home before collapsing for several days. Currently, she felt worse, although better also in some strange way. She opened one eye to look back at Greeny, who looked as bad as she felt. At least the ice had melted away from his shaggy green coat, but now he had broad patches of snow-white fur across his face and shoulders, while his entire hindquarters were about as white as they could get. Awake, she managed, then took a sip from the glass he was holding out for her. Hurts. That's a good sign. Magical exhaustion that doesn't hurt is far more dangerous. Her tutor gave a tense glance over one shoulder. I only have a few minutes before Stargazer has her next contraction, so I'll be brief. We're on one of the airships, headed for a safe city. Your friend Tempest Shadow took Everpony, everybody else from the Airy with her to attack the Storm King. Everybody except the chicks and eggs, of course. And you, because you really looked wiped out by that song. And you, managed monster through her dry throat. 
and most of the Earth Pony servants from the Griffin Airy, confirmed Greeny with a nod. I have no idea why some of them went along with the invasion. Friendship. The word seemed to set her tutor back a step and made him consider the situation in a new light. Friendship, he mused. After what you did back there. The last few weeks drove everything else out of my mind, I suppose. Too afraid to think with the two of us hiding, and then I killed. A low shudder travelled up Greenie's sides, making Monster shake off most of her crushing fatigue in exchange for pressing the side of her head against the big pony's warm neck. Had to, she murmured. Didn't want to. Killing when you want to is bad. For just a moment, I wanted to, admitted Greenie. I was angry. Furious, even. If you and Tempest Shadow had not interrupted the Windigo, I could have been. No, said Monster just as hard as she could with a firm head but. There were no other words she could think of, so she just stayed there with her head pressed against Greenie's warmth until a low distant moan broke the silence. Another contraction, said Greenie. I better get back there and, keep doing what I've been doing. Hippogriff births don't seem very easy. Without another word, the pale green pony vanished into the back of the airship cabin, but was quickly replaced by a much smaller griffin who practically bounced up to Monster and started immediately talking. I'm Princess Sunshines but you can call me Sunny and your twilight sparkle like the pony who beat Nightmare Moon and freed Princess Luna but I thought you'd be larger even though Greeny said it was complicated and I should give you some space until you recovered and I don't know why you need to recover from just singing even if we did make a giant humongous glowing heart out of fire with our song and the Wendigo sizzled like worms on a griddle and vanished, the little griffin paused to breathe and swallow before continuing slower. Even if he was my grandfather. Sorry, muttered Monster. Don't be, snapped the little griffin, looking much older for a moment. He stopped being my lineage when he betrayed all the griffins. He is dead to me, dead to our clan, and dead to all griffins. Sunny stopped at that and looked so crushed that Monster had to rely on the lessons she learned from her friends. She moved closer to the small griffin, who was still slightly larger than Monster and wrapped her forelegs carefully around the trembling feathered neck. It's okay to be afraid, she whispered slowly, trying her best not to mess up the words. I'm afraid a lot. Trixie says sometimes brave ponies are the most afraid of all. Despite Sunny shaking her head, Monster pressed on like Trixie had taught her, taking advantage of the opportunity to get her words out before emotions could confuse them. You woke up the great big dragon. Spike is only a little bitty dragon, but sometimes he wakes up with fire, so Trixie uses a long stick to poke him. Then you rode on his back to attack the Windigo. That was awesome, added Monster, because Scootaloo always said that after some pony did something really dangerous and survived. The trembling under Monster's embrace slowed, and Sunny opened up her big golden eyes again, blinking away some tears. That was pretty awesome, wasn't it? Monster nodded against Sunny's warm feathered neck, but she slowed her motion as something began to bother her. She wanted to tell her friends all about what had happened and show them Sunny and all kinds of things, but the wrongness itched at her horn. Where are we going? she asked carefully. Northshire, said Sunny. There are ponies there. No, said Monster just as hard as she could. We're not going to join the attack on the Storm King said Sunny just as forcefully in return. There are eggs and pregnant mares on this ship. It is my responsibility as the princess of our airy to see to their safety. No. Ever so slowly, Monster moved her head until her horn pointed at the cabin wall. That way, she said. My friends need me. Cadence. SS Shiny. They're fighting. Something terrible. Dark. We have to hurry. Asterisk. Go on, encouraged Trixie, giving Rainbow Dash a push to the flank to get moving. You and Fluttershy brought back the information I'm working from, after all. Get out there and help her entertain the crystal ponies and try to make them feel happy so their magic can keep King Sombra at bay. It isn't going to help if we can't find that crystal heart, snapped Rainbow. 
you've got Rarity making weird hats for the Crystal Fair, Pinkie Pie and Applejack busy baking, and there's no pony out looking for it. I sent the kids, said Trixie, trying to sound confident instead of terrified. It was either that or have them running around underhoof with Princess Cadence and, whatever they name that weird foal with the huge wings. Shining Armor can't help because he's still trying to keep the city shield up, and Sunburst is hopelessly lost in that dusty library, looking for anything to help. So, Rainbow Dash took a look over her shoulder and the ornate Pegasus armor they had found. All we can do is stall until the kids find the Crystal Heart? That's your best plan. Unless you think Twilight is going to come bursting through the dome over the Crystal Empire to save the day, yes, snapped Trixie. Really? Rainbow Dash grinned. That would be awesome. Asterisk. We're all going to die, right? Grubber gave Tempest Shadow a sideways glance from where they both stood at the prow of the lead airship. All around them, a fleet of airships and Royal Guard chariots filled the sky, with individual griffins and Pegasi flying ahead as scouts. It was an overwhelming force the kind that Tempest had always wanted when in service to the Storm King's expansionist desires, but now she had to compare it against the forces in the King's Lair and it really should have been bigger for them to have a fair chance at what she was attempting. I thought so a few hours ago. Ask me again tomorrow, said Tempest, not changing her grim expression one bit, although she did shift her eyes sideways to look at the nocturne couple flapping lazily along to one side of the airship. Without new friends, I would have been dead twice. I never thought that bitch would jump. Grubber shrugged, although he moved to keep Tempest's body between him and Laminia. Sometimes, friendship needs a little push. End of chapter 93 Tripartite, part 11